Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Traction.gg podcast, where we talk about racing games, sim racing, and racing esports. Joining us today is David Brabham, son of three-time Formula One world champion Sir Jack Brabham, and also a three-time 24-hour of Le Mans victor. David is continuing the over 70-year legacy that the Brabham name has by entering brand new and exciting markets, such as a new road and track hypercar, Brabham liveried simulator equipment, and also a brand new Brabham esports team. He has a long and storied career in motorsport, including two GT class wins and one overall victory of the 24-hour of Le Mans race for Peugeot in 2009, two American Le Mans series championships, a JGTC championship in a McLaren, a Bathurst 1000 victory with his brother Jeff. The list goes on. He's also raced in BTCC, supercars, and the FIA GT1 World Championship to boot as well. So here we discuss that storied career, obviously, but then we also touch upon the Brabham name's move into the virtual racing world. So, without further ado, David Brabham on the Traction.gg podcast. Well, David Brabham, pleasure to have you here. How are you today? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm good. I'm good, yeah. I'm uh, speaking to you from Bista Heritage. I don't know if you know Bista Heritage. Oh, but, um, yes, I've been there myself, actually, for a car show. That's okay. a really um, cool place. Yeah, there's plenty of them here. Yep. Yeah, it is a very cool place. It's uh, where my uh, Brabham branding office is located. Yep. As we speak, we're just an hour or so away from uh, what was a Brabham eSports team announcement, which I thought would be a really good opportunity to speak to you about. So thank you very much for your time. Um, yeah, sure. And so before we jump into that, I'd like to talk about uh, you know your involvement in simulators in the past and this current eSports team and where Brabham Automotive is, is going in the future. But for those who don't know, perhaps, I know it's going to be very difficult because you've got a long and storied career and a very successful one in motorsport. Uh, but for our esports and sim racing based audience, if we could run through very briefly uh, your hi highlights of your career in motorsport. So starting with where it all began, of course, with your family and your father, the Formula One world champion, and how you then fostered your own career and made it all the way to Formula One. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try and condense it. As, yeah, that's best, a very difficult task. As to best do I that. can. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up, uh, you know, in a, in a very famous racing family, particularly in Australia. Although I was born here, my dad, you know, did Formula One. He was a three times Formula One world champion. Um, Brabham Formula One team started in 62. They won in 67 and 66 and 67. Um, dad being the only driver still to have won a world championship in a car of his own construction. Um, and of course, the Brabham Formula One team continued after he retired and we went back to Australia. The F1 team continued through the 70s and 80s and the early 90s before it stopped. Um, and I went back when I was five and I, I wanted to play football. I uh, wanted to play for Man United uh, as a kid and because uh, I never really saw dad race. So it really See. wasn't in, in my psyche, you know what I mean? But I mean, mm. hell, I used to walk past trophies every day, but they were objects. They didn't really mean anything to me. Right. So um, I then got sent to an agricultural boarding school to be a farmer because we actually had a farm, about a four and a half thousand acre farm, and I was going to be a farmer. Uh, and of course, every time I got onto the farm and got into a vehicle or a motorbike or a tractor, it was always flat out and sideways. So speed, the love of speed was always there. But um, in terms of racing, no real interest until I left school, went to America, saw a go-kart uh, in a workshop when my brother was racing over there. And that was the spark. So I started racing in Australia in go-karts. And a couple of years later, I won the Australian Gold Star in, in Formula 2 that then sort of catapulted me to the European series. Right. Um, and then, you know, I won the F3 championship, won Macau, um, and then straight to Formula One, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise. So I did Formula One with Brabham in, in 92, uh, sorry, 1990. It finished in 92. Mm -hmm. Went to sports cars with Jaguar. Um, and uh, really sports cars was, was my main career. I did do Formula One again in, in 1994 with Simtech. Yep. Um, so around, you know, my teammate uh, died 
<clears throat> and Senna that weekend. So I was involved in, in that era. Um, and I then went into really sports car racing after that, although I did a, I did a year of BTCC with BMW, which was, which was great fun. Um, raced in Japan, raced in America, uh, won Le Mans a few times. So yeah, I mean, you've done quite a lot, very privileged to have had that kind of life to, to race around the world, race some really cool cars and, and win some big trophies. So yeah, it's, um, certainly an incredible career. But for me as well, winning the Bathurst 1000 in the Super Toro era must have been particularly mm -hmm. special. And uh, still only the, I think, the JGTC victory in the Makano Fun is the only non-Japanese car to win that championship to this day, which is I think pretty, it is, yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah, that was cool. 96, yeah, went to Japan with the McLaren F1 and, and won the championship. And as you say, it's the only non-Japanese car that ever won there. So uh, that, that, was, that was pretty cool. Um, and of course, like I said, the touring cars and winning Bathurst with my brother. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that was a highlight. Having grown up in Australia, Bathurst 1000, <clears throat> you know, is is the oh, big yeah. one. It's a bit like the Monaco Grand Prix yeah. here or um, mm -hmm. uh, the Indy 500 in America. You know, the Bathurst 1000 is is the big one. And and to, you know, to won that with, with you know, within the family and with my brother, you know, we both won Le Mans in separate years and, and we won Bathurst together. So, um, yeah, very cool. Yeah, I still watch uh, the Bathurst. I watch it every single year, bit by bit, maybe not live, but I certainly watch the full, yeah, full race right. every year. It's an amazing spectacle, and I would love to go there one day. Um, yeah, it's an awesome I, track as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I only know it from the sim world, of course, but yeah. <laughs> it must be pretty special to actually uh, drive around it, those changes of elevation and the narrow walls. Um, sure. I, I also, you mentioned there just casually, oh, I won Le Mans a few times, you know, with uh, in the GT class and in overall for for Peugeot uh, and in that mm. when you did win it overall that was in the height of the sort of Audi Peugeot rivalry and you were in the year where Peugeot did break through and, and break that Audi dominance what was it like to race in that era with those manufacturers fighting against each other the competition at that stage between the manufacturers was pretty intense um, the stakes were high pressure was on uh, I think the pressure got to to a few people because we we just didn't necessarily have the fastest car, but we knew we had to stay out of trouble to win that race because we could see a lot of other people were going to get into trouble, and they did. And uh, so we we had a perfect race, and and I managed to be on the podium again, which was the third year in a row for me um, with the GT stuff uh, um, the previous two years. But right. to win overall was was yeah was was great, and to do that against the might of Audi was pretty satisfying as well. Well. And uh, I'd also like to ask as well, just really quickly, and you've reminded me of something there, but you obviously were instrumental in the development and driving the Panos Esperanti. The, the GT1 one with the roof for me is something very evocative of that GT1 era. Was it as loud to drive as it sounded like from watching the footage? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, James Weaver, actually, who used to race that car with us, yeah. put it brilliantly. He said, you know, when you drive a, drive a Panos, you, use, you, you actually lose the will to live sometimes because it was so hot and so loud. Um, it was, uh, yeah, there were some very tough moments because, you know, we, we didn't have, our cool suits didn't work that well and, um the, you know, the, the cockpit temperatures were still very hot back then, um, you know, mm. 70, 80 degrees inside. And it was just insane, particularly if you raced in Japan in the 1000K in, in August, oh, when you got right, the humidity yeah, out there, it's just deathly. But um, yeah, that was a very unique car. And then of course the roof got cut off in 99. And, mm. you know, we, we actually went to Le Mans in pre-qualifying and were second overall, which was, we stunned everybody, including ourselves, that that thing actually went that quickly around there but it was never never a car to win Le Mans it just wasn't efficient enough uh, it was good for American racing but not not Le Mans so every time we went there we knew we were there to compete and try and finish but ultimately the Audis and BMWs and um, uh, Porsches you know they, they were all they were all just a bit 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 better than we were really right certainly though from a, if I can speak from a, uh, a spectator point of view I think lots of people were willing on the panels against the, the might of the yeah, like the Porsches and the Mercedes. And yeah, we were certainly we're definitely some spectacular. Dogs. David and yeah. Goliath, yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that was epic. Okay, well, I feel like we could talk about your real world motorsport career forever and a day. I would certainly love to at some point. And 
uh, I don't want to gloss over it in any way. But today there was the announcement of the Brabham esports team. So if you could tell us about the initiative, that would be interesting. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, obviously we've seen that um, online racing has has grown massively over the last few years. Um, I, I'm not new to, let's say, being in a simulator mm. um, uh, to do racing things, but not necessarily to in a gaming sense, but actually more in terms of car development, tire development. So back in 2007, 8, 9, 10, in, in the Acura P1 program and, and P2 program that we were doing, we, I spent a lot of time in the in a simulator, which actually was a Cruden-based simulator, which was a big moving platform. There was about a million pounds spent on it to get <clears throat> to get it to where we wanted it. Wow! And um, um, like I said, I spent a lot of time in there developing myself as a driver because I found that um, you could do some amazing things very quickly in a, at a racetrack if you've been on the simulator and prepared. And from a team point of view, we were able to make aerodynamic changes, feel them and, you know, replicate that on track. Um, new aero parts were done the same. So it was a fascinating world for me to, to be involved in and, and to learn. <clears throat> and, you know, kind of fast forward now to this kind of um, era that we're in where online racing has just got bigger and bigger and mm. bigger. We kind of felt that, you know, just recently we, we launched, um, you know, some Brabham Motorsport inspired simulators with a partnership with Base Simulators, which is literally just down the road from where we are today. Right. Um, and then the natural progression was obviously to go and do some um, esports and do some racing online. So um, we're excited yeah. to see that the we've, could, we've kind of gone from the, the real world to the virtual. I see. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's using your experience from working on simulators to develop real-world uh, cars. You've got the partnership with base simulators, like you mentioned, for those who want to go to the ultimate level. And now you're also placing the Brabham name into the evolving world of esports. It's a very uh, interesting initiative. Um, do you have any specific aims for the esports team in particular? I know, obviously, as we speak, the first race for the Brabham esports branded team hasn't actually happened yet. So I suppose it's early days, but is a championship you'd like the team to win in the future? Uh, look, I mean, we we know we're going in. You know, we've still got a lot to learn. Um, yeah. We've got some we got some good people around us to help help guide us through through that journey. And um, yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, you, your ultimate goal is to be the best you can be, isn't it? I mean, it always has been for us on the real world. And obviously, ultimately, our goal is to be one of the best teams out there in uh, in the virtual world. So um, that will take time. We've got to learn and we've got to develop. And, you know, hopefully with our drivers, I'll be able to help them um, probably more from the mental side than, than mm. the technique side because it's slightly different than, than we want to be from the real world. Um, but certainly in terms of mental preparation and development, um, there's a lot to be gained in, in that area and we'll be working with our drivers to be able to do that. I see. And where do you see, I don't know if you've got any opinions on where esports or racing esports in general is headed. Do you see it as somewhere that could feed into uh, real world mud spots or is it um, a separate thing that lives alongside it or is there a, a bit of both perhaps i'd say at the moment there's probably a bit of both i mean you know we're the, the, the real world and the virtual world are getting closer and closer uh because you want to have that experience of of being in the real world but sitting at home and you're you know you could be anywhere in the world but mm. you could be involved in a race that is racing out there at the same time. Um, the, the, the technology now is just getting better and better for that kind of experience. And it'll be fascinating to see where it ends up, but or you, yeah. you know it's got it's got huge potential growth, which is why we're, you know, why we're in it now. Yeah, I mean, personally, I think it's had a huge explosion over the last couple of years, especially, but it's still relatively in the nascent stages. Like mm. it's still early days. If you think about how old motorsport is and how young racing esports are, there's still a lot of progression to make, I think. So when the esports uh, championships kick off in, in a couple of days at the time of recording for Brabham Esports, and hopefully you get to know some of the drivers and the team managers and the personnel involved, do you think there'll be you'll see some parallels between a young rising esports star trying to make it in the world of sim racing and then maybe trying to cross over into real world motorsport? Um, and your early mud spot career where 
it, these a lot of these esports drivers they're reliant on sponsorship, they're reliant on prize money, and then they're trying to fund it into a full time thing. But a lot of them do it in the spare time. Are there any parallels there to a budding carter, let's say, in Australia? Yeah, I mean, look, not too dissimilar. I mean, at the end of the day, it, uh, if you want to grow and, and get better, you, you've got to have cash too, haven't you? So you've got to get the sponsors yeah. and the partners to, to help you along that journey. You, who benefit from that experience as well as as you? And it's finding how that, um, you know, that win-win situation can be for your for your partners. So it's, it's important not to just think about Oh, well, just give me the money and let me race. It's like, okay, yeah. I'm doing this, but how can this help you? You know, so mm. um, yeah, that's that's really important. And 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 that that'll never change, you know, it's always been there. And of course, in the real world, you know, the money that drivers now have to bring to even get a seat is insane. You know, yeah. um, I was one of the lucky ones because when I came over here, I had a sponsored drive and then I won a sponsored drive the following year. And then I was a paid driver in Formula One in 1990. I, I kind of stopped full-time racing in 2012 and I was a paid professional. I never, never had to bring money to a team, mm. but that's rare. I mean, really rare. So in today's world, you know, um, it just, it just costs a lot of money for, for, for people to go racing and, and the sim, you know, racing on simulators gives people that experience. Um, you know, we've seen that crossover before from, you know, virtual world to going to Le Mans with the, with the Nissan Academy program that they yeah. had, you know, we, we've already seen, and that's been, you know, it's always surprising, I think, for certainly people like uh, sort of my generation, I guess, is, is to see that someone's never gone racing before being online and then gets in a race car and is, damn far straight away you know what i mean you're kind of scratching your head and you go well, hang on, how's that work you know it's uh it's, it's astonishing really what 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 people can achieve by being uh being online and and, and racing yeah and let's let's hope we see well from my side personally i think i would love to see more of that happening and uh the drivers who do make it into the real world from the virtual world i think they can if to get to that stage they have to have racecraft they have to have set up nose and that can be some elements can be transferable but obviously the sensations of driving are very very different i'm sure um just it's, in terms it's of like being a professional driver you know you, yeah. you you if you if you act professionally and you do your homework and you know you you look at the data you look at where how you can improve uh with your setups and obviously you as a person how you can adapt and change and and become better um no different to being in the real world yeah I agree completely. Yeah, you have to be very professional and dedicated in both the real and the virtual worlds. And mm -hmm. the latter has become more and more true in the virtual world, especially I think in the last three years when big sponsors and backers are involved and the levels just stepped up another notch, I believe. Um, just yourself from, I think you've dabbled briefly in some sim racing as well because you took part in the Races All-Stars series uh, during That's the correct. pandemic lockdowns. Was that Was that good fun? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it goes well. <laughs> <laughs> when it goes well, it can be incredibly frustrating as well. Um, yeah. You know, you, I have to say, you know, it was, it was, um, took a bit of, you know, getting used to and, and trying to understand the technique in how to be fast in a, in a simulator. And I had some great races, and uh, but I had some shockers as well because I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think I ever did one clear lap at the start. I mean, I, I was in I the see. wall three or four times before I could get, and you, you, you're, you're last, and then by the time you cross the line on the first lap, you know, you could be seventh. You know, and you're like, mm. well, because you've seen lots of cars doing the same thing, and um, yeah, it was a bit of a lottery, but it was you know, it was good fun, and obviously during COVID when. You know, there were other problems going on in the world. It was it was nice to be able to get in and and not just have the racing, but you know, I was racing with a bunch of drivers that I I knew, you know, personally knew. Um, not all of them, but certainly most of them. And right. uh, it was nice to connect and talk and and you know have a bit of banter. And it was it was fun to watch as well. So thank you very much for for being part yeah. of that. And uh, it was also hilarious that Jacques Villeneuve was doing it on a gamepad. But but anyway, that's yeah, that's I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> um, So yes, keeping in the sim world, you mentioned it earlier, but you have got this uh, partnership um, with Base Performance Simulators. They're doing three uh, Brabham livery themed simulator setups. 
They're obviously mm. not necessarily for the likes of me per se, but they are for someone who wants uh, the ultimate plug and play setup, especially with a with a really nice design and, and problems uh, input. How did that relationship come about? Well, uh, you know, like, like I said, where I'm sitting here in Vista Heritage, my office is is um, you know Brabham Branding's office. So I own the the, the business. I own the brand Brabham. Right. I've got. Mm-hmm trademarks around the world and we are essentially a kind of brand licensing company that we work with partners to bring uh, companies or products to market so Brabham Automotive is one of those partners so obviously we created the Brabham BT62 um, and the 63 and the BT62R road version as well Um, all under the Brabham name which is under licensed and, and is one of our partners with an investment group out of Adelaide. Um, and of course, that we started that in 2018 in terms of going live um, and announced who we are. And cars are made in Australia um, out of Adelaide. Um, the ultimate track car experience, you know, 700 horsepower, 1,200 kilos of downforce, mm. weighs under a ton, you know, so quite a high performing vehicle on, on track. Um, and uh, you know, kind of moving moving forward after we launched all of that and got to where we are now, you know, we're looking at other projects that the brand can be involved in outside of, let's say, Brabham Automotive. So, the simulator side, because of my experience in simulators and online racing, where we wanted to do, we, where we wanted to get to with you know a Brabham esports team, mm. uh, you know, doing a, a simulator with with Darren Turner's company, based based performance. You know, Darren and I raced, raced together many times. We won them on with Aston Martin together, um, and he was probably one of the f- first of the drivers to get really involved in simulator. Um, work with McLaren uh, well before I did with my my stuff with Acura. So um, you know we've we obviously he lives five his office is five minutes from where I live. So it was I, I know a lot about them and and it just seemed like a really good thing to do and do a partnership with them in terms of as you say three iconic um, mm-hmm. liveries from from our past the BT19 which was my dad's era Jack when when he won uh, his world championship in the green and gold. The BT19, BT46B, famous, probably the most famous Brabham cars, the fan car. Yeah. Uh, did one race at one of the Swedish Grand Prix with Mickey Lauda. Um, people wanted to ban it. Uh, it only did one race, wasn't wasn't officially banned, but they pulled it because it had such an advantage on it and it was just going to destroy the sport. Um, and then the BT52, the white and blue Pamelot colour type um, with Nelson Piquet winning the World Championship in a Brabham in uh, 1983 so those three iconic colors that comes out in the um, in the sims as well as some of our merchandising as well for Brabham heritage i see yeah well the simulators look spectacular in my humble opinion and the way the, the livery and design has been replicated is uh, absolutely spot on i believe so you must be pretty proud to see that yeah we are uh, yeah thank you yeah yeah sean bull i don't know if you know sean bull he does a lot of formula one liveries now Oh, okay. uh, we we started working with Sean literally when he was uh, just starting out, and he, we saw some of his work on Twitter and picked up the phone and, and started working with him. And he he's just got bigger and bigger, and uh, uh, he was uh, he obviously was involved in putting these liveries together on on the simulators. You, you actually mentioned there as well the Brabham Automotive uh, business, which has the B sixty two and uh, other variants. Um, How's that going at the minute, first of all? And second of all, if you, you had someone who purchased one of these, uh, the track versions, maybe they could have used one of these simulator setups to sort of learn the tracks ahead of time as well. Is there a, a relationship yeah. there, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously, like I said, we we came to to market in 2018 in, in May with the car. And, um, you know, we had lots of high expectations and timelines, but, you know, some of those have been pushed down the road. Uh, one because you know it's a challenging market, but it, you know, COVID obviously uh, you know prevented us from building cars as quickly as we would have liked for customers. But you know to start an automotive company from scratch, um, build a car, develop a car, take it to market, get customers, deliver cars to customers. You know they're big milestones. You know it's not not an easy thing to do. 
Um, so, you know, we, we just, at the end of last year, I did a race in the uh, BT63, which is the GT2 car for the Fanatec um, SRO GT2 championship. And um, yeah, that was good because that was another evolution of the vehicle and, and into the GT2 program. And for me to do that race was cool. Uh, we did a previous race in 2019 with the BT62, which was its first ever race, which we won straight away. Um, you know, so for me personally, driving a Brabham on Brabham straight at Brands Hatch crossing the finish line was <laughs> a pretty, pretty cool experience when my dad did it in 66 in the F1 car. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it, great, great memories. And um, you know, any of our customers, not all customers, not all people get. Um, let's say, um, let's say of that age are, are simulator people. Okay. Um, but I think the more they do use the simulators um, in terms of preparation for their racing, uh, I, I think we all know whoever's been involved in racing in the real world and have used simulators to help them prepare. Um, it, it, it goes a long way. It goes a long way. And, and, I, and when I did the when I did the the first let's say simulation run at the Detroit Grand Prix circuit here in Vista, actually uh, with Worth Research, who was involved in that project, uh, I went over to um, to Detroit to do the ALMS race. And it was the first time, like I said, that I'd been on a simulator and prepared before I got there. I see you. And I, they said, right, you go out first. I, I'd never been the circuit and I was a second and a half quicker than everyone straight away. And, and it took to the end of the season, uh, end of the session before anyone got close, but I was so much better prepared than them. And it was like a light bulb moment. Mm. <laughs> it was like, wow, the, all that prep work and the, and the, the, the track model was pretty rude at the time. There was no, no laser scanning or anything like that, okay. but it, it really did highlight to me back then, um, you know, what you can do and, and prepare yourself leading up to a, a, an event. Yeah, especially if it was like a, a new circuit or something like this. And then if you have a simulated version, then that's definitely got to be an advantage. Um, oh, because yeah. you yeah. know the way around the track and other people yeah. might not, right? Yeah, well, when I first started racing, we had none of that. You know, you yeah. walked the track and and you, you learned by feel and, and all that sort of thing, you know, which was good training. There's no doubt about it because I, I was mm. always good at going to a track and, and learning it fairly quickly. But being on the sim and, and doing that just accelerated that process. Yeah, I see. And certainly now it seems to be part of the, the modern racing drivers uh, preparation or many anyway, not everyone, but certainly yeah. many, many factor that in, don't they? We should just about wrap up there. But before we do, I'd like to loop back to uh, real world motorsport and your career specifically. So if of all the cars you've driven in your uh, fated career, if you could pick one to drive for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? And I'm going to guess based on what you said previously, it might not be the pain Oz. But <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I look, I, I was privileged enough to drive a lot of really good cars, a lot of bad cars as well, but a lot yeah. more, more good than bad. And um, uh, the one car that always sticks up in my mind is uh, in 1991, um, I joined Jaguar and the world sports car team. Ross Braun was the chief guy there. He designed mm -hmm. the XJR 14. It was the pink silk cup. It was the last one of the the, the silk cup cars because they stopped at the end of 91. Mm -hmm. uh, but we won the world championship um, with Teo Fabi as the driver, Derek Warwick. Um, I, I joined halfway through that year um, and the XJR 14 at that time was, was just a massive leap ahead of anything else. We would have qualified in the top 10 of an F1 race with that car. Yeah, that's mad. You know, and, it, and, it, and it was, you know, way twice, more than twice as much as what that, that F1 car did. So, mm. I mean, if you ask any of the other drivers who drove the XJR 14, Derek Warwick, uh, Martin Brundle, you know, some of the others, they, they'd all say the same thing, you know, Whenever asked, you know, what is the best car you've ever driven? What's the one that sticks in your mind? Right. It's the X XJR 14. That's a nice Jag. Yeah, and it looks so sleek and lithe. It's an, a superb design visually. And I yeah, can't imagine yeah. what it would have been like to, to drive. Amazing, it was amazing. Special era for the World Sports Car Series as well, wasn't it? It was, yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for your time, David. I guess we'll just end on, uh, what are your plans for the year ahead? 
Uh, well, you know, I mean, obviously, um, you know, Brabham Automotive will continue to to pump out the cars, and yeah. um, there's a racing program in Europe that will be announced soon. Um, we've got, obviously, from a branding point of view, we've got the the simulators, we've got the esports that we've kind of focused on at the moment, yeah. um, and you know, we're, we're also looking at other other projects that we can get involved with. The Brabham name can be a benefit where it's a win win for for both parties. I see. Well, that sounds very exciting. Thank you very much for your time, David Brabham. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us once again for the David Brabham interview on the Traction.gg podcast. We'll be back, same place, same time, next week. On a Monday, we release uh, new episodes. We're still in the current season, so there will be a new one next week. If you enjoyed this, please do subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts if that's the platform you listen to. If you listen to on Spotify, you can press the follow button, but also on the mobile app, leave a rating as well. That enables us to get more guests on and create more podcasts. It's also free. So thank you very much for doing that. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment below with your favorite David Brabham uh, career highlights so far. And please do like and subscribe on there as well. Otherwise, keep it pinned. We'll be back next week. Mm